Okay. So my name is Lucy Campagnolo. Thank you very much for attending this webinar about cosmetic R&D in space. First of all, I wanted to, to thank our sponsor, Cosmetic Valley, for co-organizing this webinar, and our expert and panelist of the day, uh, the company Space Commerce Matter, with Cynthia, Jonathan, and Molly, who will provide their expertise, and our uh, panelists to, to discuss today, uh, Hilda Steinmitt from Space Application Services and Highs Cube. And uh, uh, I'm so sorry. One second, please. Yes. So Hilda Steinmitt and Mike Johnson from Zin Technology and Matthew Lynch from Procter & Gamble. But before uh, we get started, I will uh, start with a small introduction. Can you go to the next slide, please, Jonathan? Next slide. So this webinar <coughs> will, will take one hour and a half. We will start by explaining who we are and why are we going to speak about cosmetic in space because it's quite an unusual uh, topic. And then, and this is the most important part, we are going to describe what's in for cosmetic industry in space, what's so unique about the space environment and what kind of uh, relevant application and experiment and activity can be performed in space. Then I will explain how to engage in such uh, space activity together. And we will have a panel discussion with all our panelists to share their point of view in the commercial space activity. Then we will have 20 minutes for the question and answer. Please feel free to uh, write your question either in English or in French and we will translate them for our panelists in the chat or in the question and uh, answer folder just in this uh, web interface. Okay, next slide please. So when we speak about space, what are we talking about? To be more precise, uh, we talk about low Earth orbit, which is approximately 400 kilometers above our head. And um, in, uh, in this area, we have the International Space Station. You may have heard about the ISS in the news, which is, um, to, to be a little bit um, uh, schematic, it's a laboratory in microgravity and in the space environment. And uh, it's habited by uh, astronauts and they perform maintenance work, communication work, but also a lot of scientific experiments. And uh, usually we don't hear a lot about cosmetic because the, most of the experiments that are performed in space are more uh, dedicated to general life science and fundamental research. Next slide, please. But you, you may have heard it in the news with the latest flight from, uh, from Jeff Bezos and uh, Richard Branson's uh, war in space. Um, there is more and more of commercial initiative and space is opening to a broader range of, um, of activity. So here you see some futuristic uh, artistic view of, of possible new space station, new automatic capsule. And what does that mean for industry on Earth? It means that it will be easier to go to, to space, that you don't need to be a space specialist to have your experiment done on board, and that it will be cheaper. And this is what we would like to discuss with you today. Next slide, please. OK. So when, when we look at, uh, at, um, at Europe, um, there is not so much noise with respect to the United States regarding space, but we believe that this is the right opportunity and the right time to engage in such activity. And when we talk about life science industry, we had two previous webinars, one on life science in general and one on agronutrition. Today is the third about cosmetic. You have lots of uh, innovation and strategy on Earth. So what we propose here for European industrial players is just to add in complement an additional uh, innovation framework in space. And so the idea is to make use of the unique low Earth orbit environment to support or to complement the terrestrial innovation with the idea of having return of investment on Earth. So the idea here is not to prepare for space exploration, also, some finding can then be applied in space exploration programs, but it's really to focus on the terrestrial market. Next slide, please. So who are we? Uh,
it's the uh, hybrid organization. We are located in Toulouse, in south of France, and we are an economic group of interest. Uh, our main member are the French Space Agency and Toulouse Hospital. And we, uh, our mission is to provide expertise and operational support in the field of space physiology and medicine, and to support ground-based clinical research, but for space application, and then to promote innovation between space and health. Next slide. In terms of, of background, we have a whole team that is dedicated to ISS mission. So we provide expertise to the European Space Agency to uh, perform training, and uh, medical follow-up of, of European astronauts. And we also help the scientists implement their experience in the International Space Station in the field of physiology, biology, and microbiology. We operate a clinical research infrastructure located on Toulouse Hospital. And the idea is to have people lying down for a certain amount of time because that mimics the effect of microgravity on the physiology of the body. And with that and without going to space, we are able to test what we call countermeasure. It could be drug, it could be a um, nutritional protocol in order to minimize the, uh, the impact of, uh, of space on the body. And then uh, I'm part of the application and innovation team. We try to support startup SME, but also larger group to do uh, activity and to benefit from space-based data or expertise. Next slide, please. We are also um, supported by Connect by CNES, which is the initiative of the Pre French Space Agency to a new community of users for space. So to go out of our usual community and to meet people, for example, like the cosmetic industry and try to work together to understand what are you need, what we can offer and how to work together. Next slide, please. So for that, we have dedicated a whole team that uh, try <laughs> to speak a non-space language. So we do lots of promotional events. Uh, we uh, operate also the French ISABIC, the business incubation st centers for startup. We organize lots of hackathon and we also try to organize private workshop to industry to brainstorm about new idea. We have a team dedicated to provide expertise and uh, patent to a non-space industry in Earth observation, satcom, satellite telecommunication, and space. And we also provide uh, some funding or co-funding for projects that are using space-based assets. Next slide, please. And now we leave the floor to Nathalie Simonin from Cosmetic Valley, who I thank again for participating to this webinar. Hi, good morning, good evening. Uh, yes, I'm Nathalie Simona and I manage the Nouvelle Aquitaine office for Cosmetic Valley. I'm in charge of improving the networking between cosmetics companies and also to develop collaborative public and private projects according to Cosmetic Valley strategy. Uh, and today I speak on behalf of the National Cluster Cosmetic Valley and I'm very happy to promote a system with high level of innovation for our sector. Next slide, please. Yes, so I want to introduce my presentation in the world. Uh, next, next slide, please. And uh, uh, so the sector of cosmetics and perfumery includes five segments of products. Uh, worldwide, perfume represents uh, 15%. And then uh, makeup, I, I don't know if you can see the, my, my slide, but makeup and uh, skincare, uh, near 20, 25%, hair care and toiletries, like 25% too. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, on the world, uh, the consumption market uh, in the world represents 500 billion of euro. USA, Europe, and China are the biggest. 
Uh, next slide, please, for in the France. Next slide. Uh, in France, uh, France is the world leader. Uh, more than 15% uh, of uh, French production is exported, and uh, French is the best seller of pro product uh, in, uh, uh, over the five segments like makeup, perfume, skincare, toiletry, toiletry sorry, and uh, hair care. And the sector of cosmetics and perfumery represents in France the second contributor to the national trade balance. Next slide, please. Yes, you you can see the the the, main, the famous brands, French manufacturers like LVMH, Coty, Chanel, uh, L'Oréal, uh, Le Petit Marseillais, or so and so and so Caudalie. <laughs> uh, next slide, please. And uh, yes, uh, the French know-how in cosmetics and perfumery is spread over all trades in their sector. And from the raw materials, uh, development of your raw materials to cosmetic brands, including tests, packaging, scientific research, etc. Next slide, please. So, Cosmetic Ballet is an association uh, of, com of companies, SMR and groups, and university is established in 1949, uh, 94, sorry, and uh, competitive, and it became competitiveness cluster since 29. So, uh, Cosmetic Ballet is a structure drive by com companies, laboratories, research laboratories, and training organization. And uh, we we organize, we 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 we, we drive, and we um, sorry, we represent a, a strong and structured partnership with the states and territorial collectivities. Five hundred seventy members, uh, represented by companies and university and training organization, represented all trade in the sector and spread over the world of France. So it's national cluster. Next slide, please. And uh, the mission of Cosmetic Ballet is to develop or the French cosmetics and perfumery sector. So promoting the brand of France, connecting the now, dynamize the research and innovation developing expertise, support export, and impulse international cooperation. Next slide, please. So one of the main action of Cosmetic Valley is to develop innovation in cosmetic industry. So we build our R&D project, certify research collaboration. And there why we are, we are we are very happy to collaborate with you. I hope there will be some project with high level of innovation. And um, the, um, the Cosmetic well, uh, Valley is well connected and it manages a meta cluster, which name is Global Cosmetic Cluster and Global Cosmetic Cluster Europe. So the next slide, please. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, the, the the slide was <laughs> dressed. So I I, I spoke to, uh, about this one. Could you next slide, please? Yes, 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 yes. Um, Cosmetic Valley organize um, a new unique, sorry, international fair dedicated to innovation uh, of perfumery cosmetic sector, uh, which name is Cosmetic uh, 360 uh, in Paris in October. And I hope I will see you over there. Uh, well. <laughs> That's that's all of over my presentation, and uh, I wish you a very very good webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dali. And now we want we all want to know. I will leave the floor to Cynthia Buto from Space Commerce Matter. Cynthia, what is it so uh, interesting in low Earth orbit, and why should people from cosmetic industry be interested? Exactly. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Lucy. And Natalie, I think you actually did a great job um, in positioning this for the cosmetics industry and hoping that out of this 
webinar and the future showings of this tape session, we will generate some new projects in the cosmetic industry. That would be really great. So next slide, Jonathan. One of the reasons uh, you know, that we do these types of talks is to explain what has been done already in space um, and why would any non-traditional space company go to low Earth orbit? And the reason is because of the new science and innovation. And we're gonna talk today about the higher quality R&D and potential manufactured products. There is increased commercial opportunity and there's always marketing and branding, which is, as we know, important to the cosmetics industry as well. Next slide, please. Um, Lucy touched on the fact that low Earth orbit, where the International Space Station orbits, is just about 400 kilometers above us. We also have you know, been hearing in the news that there's so much focus right now from space agencies across the world on going to the moon, Mars, and beyond. And ultimately, this exploration agenda, the moon, Mars, and beyond, is really providing an opportunity for increased commercialization in low Earth orbit. And what that means to you is the ability to do projects in low Earth orbit for superior R&D or manufacturing and bringing them down and benef benefiting how you do your operations here on the ground. Next slide, please. We've had this traditional focus on the supply side. So we always hear about the rockets launching or the new space vehicles or the new astronauts. But on the next slide, Jonathan, what we don't hear enough about is the demand side. And you know what's being done from novel materials to new formulations to new drugs on uh, crop sustainability and new technologies. And on the next slide, what we'll show you is that these are all having real outcomes, economic benefits, innovation and science benefit, and ultimately what we really care about is humankind and social uh, benefit. On the next slide, we'll show you exactly who's doing these types of projects. You know, all of these companies that are listed here are doing life science or consumer product and industrial technology and communications or sustainability type projects using low earth orbit to ultimately come and benefit um, their operations here. And we are so lucky to have Matt Lynch from Procter & Gamble, who's really a pioneer in this type of commercial um, application of space and bringing it back um, to his own business. Uh, so we're going to make sure we save a lot of time for the panel to hear from both him and also Mike Johansson from Zen Technologies and Hilda Senuit from um, Ice Cubes. Next slide, please. Um, this is just a broad list. So, you know, you, you think about consumer products and cosmetics at the top here, but ultimately food and beverage, raw materials, pharmaceuticals, aerospace, clean tech, energy. There are so many research and manufacturing applications that microgravity and low earth orbit support. And really the rest of today, we're going to give you some of that science and some of that um, examples of companies that have done and what, what the ultimate impact is, which will hopefully start triggering thinking on your side, how could you and your organization use space to benefit your own operation? Next slide, please. Um, one of the things that we like to continue to point out, and, and Lucy is gonna come back and talk about how to engage. One thing we wanna point out is there is a lot of focus right now on bringing together cooperatives or coalitions um, for sustainability programs. How do we address climate change? How do we address sustainability? And even though you, know, you may be focused on cosmetics and production of these superior cosmetic products, ultimately we know that, um, that your organizations all also think about sustainability. So it's, it's something nice to also consider when thinking about Y-Space. Next slide, please. 
And so if you just go through the next three real quick, Jonathan, when we talk about um, space, why go to low Earth orbit, there are three primary reasons. The first, and really the, the biggest, and, this, and probably most relevant to the cosmetics industry, is microgravity and really understanding what the effect of microgravity has on you know, a whole range of areas um, in the physical and life sciences. And Jonathan will take us through those and give us specific examples of how they relate to the cosmetics industry. The second um, big phenomena is, are the extreme conditions. So when you go outside of the International Space Station, there are very extreme conditions. There's thermal cycling, atomic oxygen, high vacuum, debris impact, radiation. And what typically takes you know, uh, months or years to degrade on the Earth could take weeks um, or months in low Earth orbit. So it's an excellent environment for accelerated degradation type testing. And then the third um, area is the vantage point. So when we think about all of the satellite applications, the Earth observation, the remote sensing applications, you know, these are one of the most common things we think about with Y space. But when you actually include this, like say you're looking at your raw material acquisition from a cosmetic standpoint, you may want to look at some of these earth observation and remote sensing technologies that are available. And so over to you, Jonathan, to, to give more of a deep dive into the science and, and why would you ever consider doing something in low earth orbit? Okay, thanks, Cindy. Uh, I'm going to show some initial uh, microgravity examples first, and really kind of the overlying theme in all these examples is that in the microgravity environment, convection, sedimentation, and buoyancy are suppressed, and that allows other forces to dominate a system. So it's really kind of the underlying theme across all these examples. So again, it enables you to see what underlying forces are present in a system that can't really be observed on the ground because gravitational forces on the ground are dominant. So we start with crisp protein crystallization. Uh, you can formulate much more uh, larger and more ordered uh, protein crystals in microgravity because it's a diffusion-driven environment. And that's obviously very important for targeting significant diseases, growing proteins to uh, that are in relation to them, but also as it relates to drug discovery, formulation, and biomarker discovery. In the microgravity environment, cells uh, grow uh, differently. It's a again, it's a diffusion-driven environment. So cells form like they do in the normal body without the need for scaffolding or matrices. That's a big thing that needs to be done in Earth-based labs, but in microgravity, uh, you can formulate uh, those structures without that. And that's obviously very important for cell culturing experiments, looking at stem cell behavior and regenerative medicine. Microorganisms in microgravity, uh, they formulate, uh, form much more virulently, uh, more aggressively, larger, uh, and that uh, can be important to study more aggressive forms of bacteria, biofilms, fungi, and viruses. We also utilize microgravity. It's an accelerated disease model environment. So uh, the human body uh, or the cells uh, in the human body um, in microgravity, they can uh, mimic a much more aggressive uh, disease pathway. Um, that can be good to study uh, things like the, that are diseases related to aging, such as muscle and bone loss, cancer, organoids. And it's also, uh, we utilize uh, rodents to do uh, organism modeling uh, to study diseases in the microgravity environment as well. So again, it's a to study diseases in a much more accelerated way than you can on the ground. And also plant science. Uh, plant stressors are much different in microgravity. So you can learn about uh, how plants react to different stressors relates to microbe interaction, plant growth, uh, and also um, how that can relate to water and crop monitoring in space. Then as we get to more of the physical science, we talked about, I already talked about protein crystallization, but that same concept also applies to materials, any type of material synthesis. So on a molecular level, you can formulate a much more ordered structure of a material, uh, a material with fewer defects and hence a material with better physical properties. And that's the case for no matter what material you, you, you want to formulate, whether it's a protein, but also a polymer, a metal, a semiconductor. You can formulate those uh, structures with fewer defects because they're much more ordered without the interference of gravity during formulation. 
from a modeling standpoint, you can look at material systems, uh, evaluate their thermophysical properties, for example, without the interference of those gravitational forces to formulate those modeling parameters much more accurately, and also looking at phase transitions uh, without the interference of those gravitational forces. A big area that's probably related to uh, the cosmetic industry is looking at fluid dynamics and transport. Again, by suppressing convection, buoyancy, and sedimentation, you're in a much more uh, surface tension dominant environment, a more diffusive environment. So that enables you to really look at things like multi-phase flows, capillary flow, separations, interfacial studies without those uh, interference of gravitational forces. We also do some reaction chemistry, both flow and batch, uh, utilizing the microgravity environment to see if you can formulate uh, new products or a different uh, modification of a product. Another thing that's important is mixing, obviously without sedimentation and density gradients, uh, how do uh, different phases of, of, of uh, components mix together. And we also do some combustion studies because the properties in microgravity of, of, the, of the combustion mechanism are rather different. Cindy touched on the materials testing already. It's a great way to accelerate, uh, look how, how materials fail, how they corrode uh, in a much more a faster period of time than could be done so on the ground. And she also mentioned remote sensing. So it's a great way to gather big data sets uh, across all different wavelengths, no matter what you're looking for. And these can be data sets related to, again, looking at raw materials, finding uh, organic materials, locations of organic materials in the earth that are used to make organic cosmetics, but also looking at those bigger uh, kind of those corporate social sustainability uh, issues like climate change, pollution, uh, things like that. So uh, we utilize uh, the vantage point of LEO uh, for remote sensing initiatives as well. I'm going to touch on a couple specific examples of flight projects. These are projects that have been done uh, utilizing uh, the ISS. I'm just going to touch on a, on a handful. The first one, as uh, we talked about already, uh, Matt Lynch will be on the panel here in a few minutes to talk about this experiment a lot more that he did, uh, actually a series of experiments that he did utilizing colloidal, uh, looking at colloidal stability of various Procter & Gamble products. Uh, kind of the, the high level overview is sedimentation is a factor of phase separation. Phase separation is what really kind of contributes to uh, shelf life or a reduction of shelf life. So they really wanted to understand in addition to sedimentation, what else causes phase separation because on the ground sedimentation dominates and you can't really see what else contributes to that problem. So Matt's done a series of experiments involving that and he'll be uh, happy to share uh, some of his uh, work and findings on the panel. Another example is Delta Faucet. Uh, they wanted to look at uh, droplet formation uh, out of their shower head. Uh, how do they optimize the, the, the shower sensation? How can you make the, get the sensation of a full shower utilizing less water? So defining a more uh, water and energy effective shower head, um, they can potentially make an impact on uh, uh, reducing energy and, and water costs and, co and conserving. Uh, as it relates to cosmetics, obviously when you're talking, uh, you know, application, you know, applying a product out of a droplet or a dispenser, looking at that droplet formation, that dispensing mechanism uh, can be kind of similar to what uh, the Delta Fossil folks are studying. Look at how things uh, form and fall out of a, of a dispenser, in this case, a shower head. Now, I don't think concrete's used in cosmetics, but the phenomenon of mixing uh, is uh, relatable, I would think. So uh, Penn State University and BASF wanted to see how does concrete mix in microgravity? How can that make us, uh, make them formulate a stronger product uh, you're looking at those underlying forces, non-sedimentation, non-density gradient uh, implications of mixing in microgravity that can help them understand uh, better, better mixing mechanisms that could be used on the ground to make a better uh, homogenous product, whether it's concrete or in your case, a cosmetic or a, a, an emulsion or another type of consumer product. Elon we looked at hard to wet solids. They wanted to see when someone takes a drug, how do they dissolve more of the tablet in their system more effectively? So they wanted to isolate the solid liquid interface, the solid tablet, the liquid of the of the of the I guess in this well in in the human body, the bloodstream. So by isolating uh, just that interface, they could really see how does the, the tablet dissolve. 
uh, in the cosmetic world, if you're looking at a solid liquid interface, whether you're studying you know, the application of a product of a liquid on the skin, it's a great way, again, to isolate just those surface forces to see what's that interaction between the two phases. And lastly, um, Nalco Champion, which is now Champion X, they did a study on biofilm thickness. As I mentioned earlier, biofilms grow much more aggressively in microgravity, way more than ever could be grown on the ground. And biofilms are a big uh, factor in corrosion of oil and gas pipes. Now, obviously, uh, biofilms are also uh, a big issue in, in the cosmetic and consumer product world, growth in tubes or dispensers, and also uh, biofilm issues on skin and um, other parts of the body as well. So biofilms are, are a big um, area of focus in microgravity research because it obviously relates to many downstream markets, including uh, cosmetics and consumer products. So um, as I think it's been discussed in the chat, we will be giving you um, uh, this presentation. Uh, this slide here just gives some high level topics that could be interesting to you to study in Leo for the cosmetic sector. Uh, you can see we have a, a nice uh, mix of different types of products. At the end of this presentation, we're not gonna show it, but there is an appendix that goes through much more uh, detailed propositions in each of these topics that could help you get some better, uh, at least some initial ideas of what may be interested that might be, might be interesting for you uh, to study in Leo as it relates to your uh, field of study. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Lucy uh, to talk a little bit about how you can engage in this initiative. Thank you very much for this uh, presentation. Uh, once again, do not hesitate to ask questions in the chat. Our experts are here to answer. Uh, so uh, once we have said that, where to start? So first of all, that I would like to recommend it's come and talk to us. So either myself or my colleague marie you can see our um, contact email here, but also anyone from the panel, do not hesitate to contact us and to discuss. Mm -hmm. Um, you, you may have already an idea of uh, our project and what we offer to you is to work with you to sit down and to consolidate your project and build a proposal. Why to build a proposal? Because the idea is to gather a portfolio of projects that can be then um, uh, found by the European Space Agency in order to implement your experiment in space. If you're not really sure, we can also uh, secure a keynote to your facility or your cluster or your headquarters. We can also organize for you some open innovation workshop with your team in order to try to define what could be beneficial for you, what is feasible in space, what makes sense, and so on, and gather the right experts. So do not hesitate. We are here to help. And uh, we would love to see some cosmetic experiment fly on board the International Space Station or other um, space facility. Next slide, please. Uh, yes, yes. So I will leave the, flo the floor again to uh, Space Commerce Matter to describe who, like, who can implement your experiment on board. How does that work? And we are very happy to have space application service and Zin technology that will uh, then speak during the panel to explain a little bit more into detail what they can do for you. Thank you, Lucy. Um, and so, you know, what we just have sort of covered is the big picture of why space. And then we've given you some of the, you know, the scientific reasons why you would ever do something in low earth orbit. Um, the message we want to give over the next slides are the way that you're going to do something in space will not be exactly how you do it on Earth. But you don't have to worry about that, nor do you have to become a space expert. You know, you may want to become a space expert, and that's great. But we're, we're pretty confident that you have very busy day jobs and need to keep those day jobs. So really what we're trying to get across here are there are a number of experts like Hilda and Mike who have the facilities, the capability, they do the translation. You know, how do you do it on the earth and translating it to how it would actually be executed in space. And these really are your guides um, who will take you through the whole process and facilitate you going um, to low Earth orbit. So we wanted to highlight a couple of these. Next slide. Um, 
Zen Technologies based in the U.S. And uh, re we're really lucky to have Mike uh, here who will give us a little bit of a, of a view of the types of projects that he's worked on, um, including with Matt Lynch and with others that Jonathan presented. Um, the next slide, we have Ice Cubes based here in Europe and Hilda will give us a view of her experience in some of the really relatable areas to cosmetics and consumer products. Um, and then the next couple of slides show you that there are others. So Yuri based in Germany, Next slide, Bioreactor Express based in Italy. Uh, Lamont Aerospace based in the US. And again, what we're showing you are what they focus on. So crystallization versus microorganisms versus medical devices, et cetera. Next slide. Uh, TechShot uh, is an interesting company that actually has a 3D bioprinter um, on station and they do a number of you know, very similar uh, uh, types of projects. Next slide, please. So again, the point wasn't to go into detail with the service providers. It was really to let you know that you have um, a whole range of options of experts that you can work with and help translate how you do something on the ground and actually bring it to space. Um, and you know, these, these folks are, are the best in the business. And so with that note, Lucy, I don't know if you want to introduce, reintroduce um, the panel. Yes, thank you very much, Cynthia. So this is the time for us to, to discuss and to go a li little bit more into detail. And we are very happy today to have represented of all the chain of, of activity. So uh, as uh, just mentioned by Cynthia, Hilda Stenwit from Space Application Services and Mike Johnson from Zin Technology, they will be the expert that will take in charge all the space related activity. Uh, of your project. And then we are very happy to have Mathieu Lynch, who was a pioneer by uh, performing experiments on board space station mm -hmm. um, in the field of uh, consumer product and cosmetic. And Cynthia Buto will also provide their expertise because she has worked many years with, uh, uh, and Jonathan, sorry, I forgot you, with um, non-space companies I want to do stuff on board. And Nathalie Simonin will represent the naive point of view. <laughs> Like you, you, you heard for not for the first time because we have prepared this webinar, but it's one of the first times that we heard about our activity. And so we will have lots of questions for you, like what were your first thoughts and do you think it's doable or not? And this will be uh, quite interesting. And to moderate this panel, I leave the floor to Cynthia Buto to ask questions. Once again, do not hesitate to ask your question in the chat and we will incorporate them into the, sp the panel. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lucy. Um, so what I'd like to do is actually ask um, uh, Matt, Mike, and Hilda each to start off with a two-minute overview of your respective experience in low Earth orbit. Um, so why don't we start with Matt Lynch um, from Procter & Gamble. Hi, Cindy. Happy to be here with you today. Uh, you're um, still on mute, Mike. Uh, Matt. Sorry. Uh, I think I'm okay. No? Can you hear me? I got two thumbs up. Okay. okay, okay. <laughs> Super. Here you. Okay, fantastic. Um, happy to be here with you today. Thanks so much. I have been involved with experiments on station for probably over a decade now. Uh, we started maybe 10 years ago. We put some downy in space of all crazy things. Um, we have some pictures of that with the earth in the background. Um, and um, we ran into some, some technical challenges with putting product up in space, um, anywhere from upmassing it to some of, the, um, some of the experiences that the product underwent on, on the ability to get up to station. Um, and so maybe for the last decade, rather than putting product in space, what we've been doing is looking at the, some of the fundamentals that have been inspiring uh, us in terms of some of our complex fluid designs, which we'll share with you a bit later. Um, and a lot of that has been uh, doing a series of experiments where we've used microscopes to look at uh, colloidal particles arranging themselves, to create these kind of structured fluids. Some of it we do uh, what we call BCAT experiments, where we look at samples evolving over time from a, a bit of a distance and looking at macroscopic properties and evolution of these systems. All of it comes around to focusing on basically developing a better structured material 
and we'll talk about what that is here in a, in a few minutes. So, so it's been about 10 years um, from, uh, from shuttles all the way up to ISS, right? <laughs> a true pioneer, I would say, in, uh, in low Earth orbit. And so he mentioned BCAT, Mike. Why don't you give a view of Zen Technologies, just a few opening comments before we get into the Q&A? Sure. I mean, it was a, a great uh, introduction from you and Jonathan, actually, here, as you showed all that science. Zinn builds much of that science, and we built uh, many of the payloads for Matt uh, in partnership with Matt's uh, great ideas, and, and, and we build or, 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 or talk about or, or provide kind of access to the, the large repository of experiments, experimental platforms that are available in space. You know, my background in microgravity science goes back all the way in the early 90s to the shuttle space lab days. Um, I was on the space lab team and the space lab team for years, you know, doing shuttle science experiments, um, worked my way into building laboratories, um, the fluids and combustion laboratories were both, um, uh, both, both programs that I managed over the years. But Zid has built over 350 different payloads that have flown on space station today, both external and internal. Um, very complex facilities. Um, when you saw the picture of the flame early up in the front here, if you ever see a flame on space station, a good kind of flame, um, you know, where we're studying it, uh, Zim's built that hardware. Um, we had the very first colloid experiment. If you really look at cosmetics, cosmetics are, are really complex fluids and colloidal you know, materials. And so a lot of that type of science is what Zim does. Um, like I said, the very first phys fluid physics experiments on space station were the physics of colloid spheres, PCS. We built that. We had the very first science experiment on, on space station, SAMS, uh, Space Acceleration Measurement System. Um, we built the, the, the FCF, the Fluids of Combustion Facility, which includes the Fluids Integrated Rack, um, which houses the Light Microscopy Module, which is a scientific grade microscope that um, does do a lot of the experiments, um, the advanced colloid experiments that Matt Lynch has been involved with. Um, we also build the BCAT hardware that uh, that he described earlier, um, that also did some of the earlier science you saw for Eli Lilly and Delta Fawcett and some of the other experiments that, that we have done for commercial partners. Um, so we kind of have, have the ability to be able to partner with the science team. Somebody has a great idea. We go work with them and figure out how we can possibly accommodate that hopefully in something that already exists, or if not, we can create something new and uh, fly it and bring back great data for the science team. Great, thanks, Mike. And for our third um, uh, uh, speaker here on, with an extensive heritage in low earth orbit, Hilda, why don't you give a, a brief overview? Well, thank, thank you, uh, Cynthia, and, and thank you, Lee also for the introduction. So my name is Hilda Steenart. So I, uh, I have a researcher background um, and I work with Space Application Services. That is um, an SME um, that has headquarters in Belgium and that exists since quite some decades supporting uh, European Space Agency and other um, users and, and has built uh, scientific setups, let's say, for the International Space Station. I myself supported the European Space Agency in a function of Mission Science Office, um, cross-agency coordination uh, of research and technology um, with the other uh, agency. And now since a couple of years, I'm supporting our IceCube service. And our IceCube service gives um, direct and fast-track access to these unique assets uh, of space that um, uh, Cynthia and Jonathan very nicely uh, described. Um, so these assets of space that you cannot possibly reproduce here on Earth and that can be integrated in the everyday value chains in, for different uh, sectors for, for us Earthlings here. And so where we help is um, translating, as, as uh, Cynthia described, what you do on Earth and how that could work in an environment of microgravity and of radiation, um, and, and to help you uh, define what is a setup that most optimally um, gives you the research results that you are after. And so for that, we have a, a facility that we uh, operate on the International Space Station that can accommodate these different um, research uh, setups in different units that are very customizable and that can be accommodated in this uh, facility. 
So great. back over to you, uh, Sydney. Yeah, no, great. Thanks, Hilda. And so I think, you know, we've gotten the message and I want to get into more detail on what are some of the, you know, points of experience, Hilda and Mike, you both have. But before we get there, I'd like to ask Matt, um, you know, as this pioneer in the commercial LEO research and development, how did you get your organization? I mean, Procter & Gamble is a, I don't know, is it a Fortune 100, Fortune 500 organization, Fortune 50? It's big. Um, how, how did you get your organization to support your space work? Yeah, I think we're the largest consumer product company in the world, I think, at this point. So I don't know, it's a Fortune 20 or something like that. Um, <laughs> But you know, with the stock prices as they go all over these days of craziness, who exactly knows? Um, I uh, so so Cindy, you know, it's a it's a bit of a it's a bit of a trick, right? Because if you think about it, it seems like particularly for the consumer product business, it seems like an odd out of this world kind of concept, right? How do you develop products in space? How do I think about the products in space? Um, maybe in pharma and crystallization, that seems perhaps a bit more natural, but in in the world of consumer products, perhaps seems a little bit different. I think the biggest thing is my job at, at, at Procter & Gamble is developing, in a sense, resetting the business, resetting the commercial elements of business. Um, what, what is new? What's what's going to disrupt the markets and like that? In that sort of space, making and getting access to things that are uh, unique and different are just kind of an advantage in, in terms of being able to sustain or, or to achieve that kind of goal. Really, I've been around the company for uh, close to 25 years now, and, and it's just basically an element of trust. So I've got this mission, which says, you know, you're going to you're going to break paradigms. I'm going to trust you that this is a this is a way to kind of get the insights that we need to do that. Right. Great. And yeah. maybe to Mike and Hilda, you know, when you're working with a company that doesn't is not a traditional space company, have you seen tricks of the trade to sort of you know, to be able to move those projects forward effectively, because I'm, I'm thinking there may be, you know, people that are here today listening or that will listen in the future and think they have a really good idea, but not sure how to move it forward um, within their organization. So do you do you have experience with that? I can go first. I mean, that's what we pride ourselves. I, I would say that more than 80% of the people we work with don't come from a space background. You know, if the, if the principal investigator comes up with a great science idea, whether it be a commercial um, um, opportunity or, or physical science type capability, you know, at the university, um, you know, we go to their lab, um, we look at, you know, their experiments or what they're trying to do. Usually it's laid out over an entire room. Um, we work with them immediately to figure out how to take it from something that fills the room to a box maybe that's this big. Um, work through all the issues and problems that might be associated with launch. You know, there's a large vibration um, effort, you know, during during launch. The rocket puts a lot of vibration into it. Landing, if you, know, you need to have a sample return, there's a large uh, a shock when it comes back and lands as well. Um, and you don't want to destroy their science. So we go through all of those types of things. and. Um, look at their requirements. Sometimes they require multiple levels of containment. You know that the, the, the chemicals they're using possibly could could affect you know the astronaut. So we need to make sure that we understand how the safety for for, for the experiment would would uh, um, have to be accommodated. Um, so you know we work through all those things you know in a short period of time to get through the concepts. Um, you know, and then in partnership, we develop that experiment and, and fly it and operate it, and, and usually with great success. Great. And Helda? Yes, um, I think Lucy already referred to the possibility to set up some innovation workshops. I think that's also a great way um, for people that might have the feeling there might be something in there for, for them, but they don't know exactly how to find their way. I think that's, that's a great way. Um, I think what, what uh, Mike was saying in terms of this translation exercise, seeing um, what, uh, how your research works on the ground and then talking how should we translate that into a microgravity environment, I think is very important. Um, the fact that we are on the edge of innovation um, and that we can bring something entirely novel uh, the space environment into the this research and we may come from 
backgrounds that talk a different language. So that I think is really important to come together and bring this. Um, Lucie referred to Natalie as, as being the naive from space, but I consider myself as the naive from cosmetics. So we need to come together around the table and bring these two sides, mix them very well, and then address it to um, whoever in your organization uh, is, is responsible for the innovation and, uh, and, and also discuss possibilities of, of funds and budget. So I think these are elements that I think um, where we can help, but again, as uh, partners around the table of finding our ways through uh, through these novel approaches. Great, and I, I think, oh, go ahead. I was gonna add, it might be interesting to hear, to hear it from Matt Lynch's perspective, because Matt was one of our partners. Um, he came up with great ideas with Procter & Gamble, and we, we were able to partner with him and work through and fly, you know, his early stability or shelf life type experiments with Procter & Gamble. Um, and he's worked with us on multiple experience, experiments at this point. Maybe it would be interesting to hear, you know, uh, from the implementation side, but we think we partner well with the experimenter, but it might be good to hear from the experimenter <laughs> side of how that interface works with the implementation partner. <laughs> yeah. No pressure. I was going to, I was going to chime in there, Mike, anyway. So, um, you know, for us, um, it has been, it has been extraordinarily easy to access all this every step of the way. And, and I would say for us, there's been, three legs of a stool basically that's held everything up, right? Um, there is the application and science end from my side, which is the one end. The Zin folks, as we talked about, and I assume Hilda does the same thing, um, is the applications end. But Zin has done, in a sense, um, from, a, from a technical perspective, has done everything, right? So they build the hardware, they test the hardware, they load the samples, they run the operation units. I go up and sit with Lou and on, on, on console um, and watch our experiments being done. They download all the data for us. They give us a hard drive. And so it's start to finish. That's the second leg of the stool. The third leg of the stool that I would suggest as well that maybe Michael and Hilda, I don't know how, how the ESA works. Um, there is a NASA um, and cases hierarchy as well, right? And, and so to get an astronaut to do an experiment for you requires time. It requires scheduling. It requires putting things on manifests and all that. We have a, uh, an organization in the U.S. called USRA, which is the University Space Research Associates. Bill Meyer has been our on that, and he he handles all that. And and so dealing with the NASA folks, I met Jonathan actually through Cases, um, figuring out how to get things funded, how to work the paperwork, how to get everything set up. That's all been handled through USRA. And so for me, well, wow, fantastic! You get these great ideas, experiments. You got Mike, Michael and the Zen organization, which has been outstanding from the hardware design and all the implementation and the follow through. And you got someone like USRA that handles all the paperwork, which I couldn't possibly navigate from my position, right? And then, then working it through NASA and through cases. And I, I don't know, Hilda, how the US, uh, I'm sorry, how, how it works in ESA, but having that third leg of the stool like a Bill Meyer is, is outstanding just to kind of keep everything moving so that I don't have to be an expert in navigating NASA paperwork and cases and who does what and why, but it all it all kind of behind the scenes gets done, filled out. I just kind of sign my name for the most part and get to sign it and do the application. <laughs> yes, I so, think on the European side, we, we indeed also um, provide the interface to the agency, but I also like to think of Lucy and, and her function as being the third uh, stool in the description that you give, because she can also be the one that helps you in seeing like, okay, what, what are the next steps in the processes for you? So I, I like that description, Matt, very, of, the, of the tree uh, stool. I mean, if it can make you feel better, Matt, on, on European side, no worries, the same. I still don't understand everything. You think you know the process, you have been working in, in this field since 10 years, you have implemented so many payloads and yet come another idea from another industry and you're like okay so yeah it's it, it's something it's something completely um we have to make it the important thing is that from your point of view matt and from the point of view of our other customer that it's not a burden that somehow we have to deal with like all this paperwork and this process and sometimes it will take a little bit more time than expected but for you it should be you focus on your experiment what you want to do and be sure that we implement it in the right way because mm -hmm. uh, as uh, as hilda say we are um, 
not a specialist of your product. So it's very important to keep the right level of, uh, of uh, communication. And then you sit next to us on console and you have your experiment done by an astronaut. But uh, I, I fully agree with what was just uh, said. It's if we, we have to somehow pair to make something uh, work because we cannot be expert of everything. And you don't have the time or the resources to train uh, three people from your team to be space experts. It makes no sense. So we definitely have to speak together. I think, Hilde, I will, I will speak for you. And I'm pretty sure that uh, Michael from Zin will agree. We learn every time we work with a non-space uh, partner because there is thing we don't think about it uh, when we implement payload and um, we discover new field and it helps also for us to grow our service offer to grow our way to implement it to say okay next time that i will reach this kind of difficulty now i know this is the shortcut so i think it's, it's quite important to mm -hmm. to work together well let, let's let's uh, stick with that oh natalie go ahead sorry yeah, about so i'm sorry i don't understand everything through <laughs> but um and i don't know uh, who is connected now but uh i saw the the, the company who's uh, registered and uh it was very interesting because uh, there were there were some brands some raw materials some uh, packaging industry but i think it's um, more than sme or it's not very big industry so uh, i have questions about uh, do you do you think we, we we need to be a big 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 um, big industry to work with you or uh, we, you, you said uh, before that we have to work together and perhaps we, uh, I could uh, structure a concession of some, some uh, industry. And uh, I think it, uh, uh, as you said, more important to, to, to explain more and to explain, to, to have more idea to, to, to research and to have more idea about uh, what can I do uh, about cells, about uh, re uh, chemistry, or about uh, so? It, it's very important, but we have to to imagine more, more, and more uh, action. <laughs> Uh, maybe I can start and then I'm sure that uh, yeah. my colleague will follow. Uh, I, I think we all agree you don't need to be a large company to implement something in space. There is lots of, of examples of startups or SMEs mm. that have done things in space. What's important, and this is where we, we need to work together since the beginning, is that uh, I won't lie to you, it costs money and it's time consuming. So we have to address all this point in a, in a clever manner. For the funding part, uh, so there is several ways to, to do it. Uh, currently, so right now, and this is why we are launching this first uh, set of webinars, there is this opportunity from the European Space Agency to co-found 50% of the total envelope, which yeah. is already something. It still means that we have to find the remaining 50%. But as you mentioned, it doesn't mean that the startup alone has to pay in cash this 50%. We have to, to, to work together to try to find other source of funding or a sponsor or to pair uh, into a, to, to build a consortium or to, to use a corporate social uh, fund, uh, RSE. I don't know how to say it in English. Um, we, we have to, and we are here also to, to help to build the, the financial part. The other thing is resources. And once again, I don't know, Matt, maybe you can share your point of view, but you think that you allocated enough resources to work on the project and also our space provider are committed to do the best <laughs> to help you, you still need people able to work. So this is something quite important for very small startups that are already overloaded with the, with the strategy. It's a, a point of, of warning. But once again, if we build the correct project, if we um, have the good estimation of resources, and this is something that we are able to do with you i don't think that uh, it's a showstopper for startup or smes okay i don't know if you guys agree with what yeah. i just said 100 percent. and and I, I would just add you know we have lots of examples on the u.s side of startups through um incubators or accelerators and and natalie as you you know suggested coming together in more of a consortium manner 
to come together um, and really brainstorm ideas that are relevant for all of those startups. And to Lucy's point, it really is a point about getting creative on the funding, you know, the funding and the resources to support the work. Because when you have a startup or a small company, you don't have the bandwidth to actually do things that are just fun because you just want to do them because they're fun. You have to do things that are really supporting your business objectives. Um, and that the same thing is true for the large companies, right? Matt, Matt, you can't just go and tinker, you know, in your in your sandbox and have fun with space. It really had to support the Procter and Gamble, you know, business objectives. So maybe we can do a little pivot here and say, you know, what ultimately were the results that you achieved, Matt? Um, and I think we might even have a an example of a video that we could play as you're as you're talking about this. But you know, did you have outcomes from this space based activity um, that you did? So before you play the video, let me give you a little bit of perspective, right? So we've been at this, like I said, for about 10, over 10 years, we in in partnership with US, USRA. Um, and and poor, poor what Jonathan said, I poor what Jonathan said, you know, our, um, our design on, on these experiments has not been developing a product in space that we ship down. That's kind of prohibitive in terms of cost from a consumer product business. But what we did do is develop um, a, a good set of understandings and insights that have been inspirational. Um, in, in terms of designing the product that you're going to share that we'll see this video for. Um, and just as a way of background, um, you know, uh, Jonathan had talked a little bit about and, and Michael had talked a little bit about um, this kind of idea of product stability. And so what we're going to do is, and, and I'll show you the video in a minute here, but what we're going to do is try to create a complex fluid. So we're going to take small particulate matter and organize that matter in space to hold uh, perfume capsules in place. And it becomes a really big technical challenge because what I have to do is I have to have, a, I'd like three things like in a stool again, like, like I was talking before. Uh, but that, that structure has to basically be strong enough um, to keep those little perfume capsules from, as you'll see in this product, from separating. So um, on, on Earth, it's a problem because these capsules themselves are light. They like this, they like to float to the top. Um, but I have to do it in a way, this, as you'll see, in, in this case, it's a spray product. And so you've got to be able to take that structure and you've got to break it down under a certain amount of stress. And so I can spray it and spray it just like water. And I've got to do it in a way, if you look at how the product's used, I've got to do it in a way that's minimal. So really, 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 really small amount of material. So I have to be very clever in how I put these structures, these little complex food pieces together. Um, and so if you want to play the video, we'll show you the outcome of this. This is actually something that is shipping to market now. Um, and I don't know if you, I don't know if you can actually hear the, I, I don't know if you can hear the video. Jonathan, can you put the sound up? Let me see. You're muted on your screen share. I don't know if that matters, like your okay. little button. So any, anybody who's interested can go Google this and find it, and you can hear you can hear the part of the video on it. But in part, what the work that we've done on station allows us to do is set up the microstructures in these complex fluids that allow us to create this product. And, and so what we've done is we've kind of, in a sense, helped create a product out of that. You've seen the video. Uh, we've got about six patents that are granted that help us uh, protect this for the company. Um, and we're working on some technical publications as well. And part of our bargain uh, with NASA is to not only create application for PNG, but also create fundamental science that then we can share as well. So we're a little behind in our technical publications and targeting this out. But so it's been a really nice set of, 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 again, 10 years, each of these experiments we do are little pieces that help us understand, but driving to a very tangible end from the company's perspective. Matt, are you okay if I put the link to the ad in the in the chat so people sure. want to get yeah, it? Yeah, it's all public. It's just, okay. Yeah. So people can that. take a look and listen and and by the way, I would just point out that you see that little blue smoke coming up. It's not really blue smoke. It's not like it's on fire. It's just it's just perfume scent that rises from from the fabric. Um, that's a little more obvious when you, when you hear it. So so it's you know um, you asked Cindy early on. You know why does the company allow me to do this? It's not playing in the sandbox necessarily. They trust my judgment to say spend the time, learn, work, and work with US or you work with NASA. And, and use that knowledge that you work to, to generate something of material value for the company in this consumer business, right? And so this is uh, something that's, that's out. Uh, I'm not sure it's, it could be in Europe, but it's certainly in North America. So, so Michael, if you want to go down to Walmart, you might find it. Um, 
it's still being distributed, but it's a very tangible outcome of, of all the effort. That we, That's we great. And so Mike, what you just, or Matt, what, I keep calling Matt, Mike and Mike, Matt, Matt, what you just described is a, a real programmatic approach to doing this, you know, 10 years, you sort of had all of these different components of your program. Um, what I'd like to find out from Mike and Hilda is, are there other examples of how fast, you know, an organization can realize a return on their investment? Are there shorter timeframes where you've seen um, at this type of activity take place? And start with you, Mike. Uh, you know, that, that can be very, depending on the complexity of the experiment. Um, we've seen return on investments as, as early as you know, three to six months from the time we've launched to the time we return data back to the to the scientist looking at a, at a certain um, uh, item that he wants to explore. Um, you know, we're very sensitive to IP, um, you know, especially for commercial payloads. Um, we partner with them and we certainly operate in a non-disclosure. Um, that data is theirs, but we also learn each time from the type of science that they're doing and, and try to implement that type of uh, capability and the types of research apparatus that we offer. Um, so that it's cheaper and easier for the next guy to come along and be able to do their science um, in, in our facilities. Um, I think that's uh, I think that's a very important part of our, our partnership. Um, you know, the return on investment is probably the most important part for the commercial um, you know customer, and uh, we try to work with them early on to come up with their business case and to understand what that might be. Um, and how we might be able to, you know, best give them the data that will give them what they need. Great. And Hilda? I agree with everything Mike said. So it really depends on what setup people need in space. Can you use um, a setup that has been used in the past? I mean, for example, we fly every couple of months a kind of crystallization incubator. Does that meet your needs? Then your samples can be included and we can define that a couple of months, even weeks before the actual launch. If you need a truly dedicated uh, setup for your scope and you want uh, a new manufacturing facility, for example, for your um, products on, on the International Space Station, it will take longer because that will need to be developed. And that's also something that development of that setup that we need to discuss in the beginning is is that something that you yourself uh, take care of, of with our guidance of, of how you can meet a space environment or is that something where you look for uh, partners to help you for that development that's also um, uh, expertise that we can provide or we can link you up with others in um, the area of the setup that you're looking after um, that can help you there. So I really think it depends from a couple of weeks, months before launch uh, to, I mean, the time it takes to develop for a more complex uh, setup to bring it to launch. And then, of course, as Mike was saying, it's it's important when you, how you can analyze your results. Um, also, I mean, we also provide the possibility to have your data down real time so you can, in fact, start analyzing it them the day itself if you want. Maybe you need the samples that might take a bit of time to return them and to analyze them and then to yeah to close that value chain and to uh, to make sure that that brings you return on, on your investment and, and your research uh, being done. Great. So, so Steve, let me let me be clear on timing, right, because because it makes it seem like every project is a decade long project. That's not really true. <laughs> the data that we get from the, each of these experiments is like a six month sort of thing. Like you said, depending on how fast you work it now, it's a little bit quicker. Um, the problem with the return on investment, like a product, it has a lot. It, the rate limiting step is not what I get off station. The rate limiting step is all the business pressure, supply chains, you know, where it fits into innovation plans within companies. And so often things that take a long time within big companies, it's, it's not because of the science that's, that's driving that time scale. It's just a lot of other business things that are totally unrelated. I will just say that you know every experiment that we've set up, we've reused a lot of stuff from, that Zinn had made that was used from other A's and BCAT experiments. Those have been great. Um, when Jonathan worked at Casis, you know they got us in the line. So things things have been um, quick. You know, I mean, and and you know six is once once you get the all the safety stuff done and everybody's comfortable, everything goes quick. You get your data relatively fast. 
but yeah. the return on if you look at the return on investment being when I get my data back, yeah, that's six, you know, four to six months tops. If you ask the question, when does a company get back commercial value from that, that can take longer and it's not really linked necessarily. Yeah, no, I right? totally agree. Totally agree. And okay. at this point, I think we should just remind the audience that you can ask questions via the chat or the Q&A tab. Um, and we will just continue on and be looking for any of your questions. And maybe at this point, Natalie, as representing you know, all of these uh, these cosmetic audience participants. Are, are there certain questions that you might have? Um, you know, did, did some of this maybe start to, to stimulate some of the thinking on some of the richer areas that could really apply for a cosmetic company? And, and again, Jonathan listed out whether it's, you know, packaging or raw materials or or the chemistry or the colloidal um, analysis. Did, did something sort of jump out at you that you hadn't thought of before the seminar? Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's difficult. Perhaps about all the, um, uh, I, I, I think it was uh, Jonathan, he is explained that about the difference between um, the, um, uh, about an emulsion uh, we have is an unstable system and emulsion, so it's different when uh, uh, about uh, the the micro gravity, and I think it could be interesting to 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 um, to to have more exp explain um, because now um, we we find a new um, a new new um, <laughs> sorry. Um, the 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 tensioactive the the new new detergent so so uh, and uh, we have to find new detergent that we have to find how to make um new uh, products uh, with less water and and less uh less detergent perhaps and uh, and how to find some new products to to um, with uh, with 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 our uh, with our orders, uh, it, it's a uh, it's a good idea, perhaps. Um, okay. But uh, about pack packaging, about uh, raw materials, uh, it's, it's it's the same because it, it's find um, n new um, yes. So I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 that was not to put you on the spot. It was just, uh, and Lucy, yeah. over to you. I think you might have a point. No, no, I think, uh, Natalie, if you want uh, to say it in French and I translate it, so right. it, it will be maybe uh, easier. I'm not, I don't, I'm not 100% sure that I know how to translate uh, <laughs> tensioactive. <laughs> <laughs> no, the tension, you know. surfactant, no? Oui, voilà. Surfactant. We have uh, cosmetic uh, is looking for natural surfactant now because natural, uh, uh, natural okay. surfactant. So we have to find uh, some uh, sugar with lipid uh, in natural uh, vegetable, and um, so uh, and we find another. Um, we have to find. We, nous avons à trouver d'autres produits aujourd'hui. C'est des vrais enjeux yeah. pour la cosmétique. Yeah. Et des produits sans eau et des produits. Et, et je pense que euh, se retrouver dans un dans un système où, où on peut peut-être comprendre comment mm. euh, des, des, des actions se font ou des interactions se font euh, dans un dans un système en, en microgravité. Uh, ça peut être intéressant pour uh, trouver des, des nouveaux produits. Ouais. Yeah. So the, the big challenge in the cosmetic industry right now is to discover new active products. And most, uh, we need, uh, for example, uh, to have natural active product or one that does not require any water. So looking at uh, biomanufacturing, bioproduction in gravity may help to uh, first uh, discover new product and second, maybe better uh, understand the interaction in such a, a restraint environment. So that could be a great idea for a cosmetic. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Lucy. I'm not yeah. sure. I, I think <laughs> I, I translated it correctly. Uh, yeah, we do um, have a question from Lorraine, I think, uh, Cynthia. 
Um, so what about the carbon footprint um, and send product to be tested in space or produced in space? That's so is that asking question. about the sustainability of, of sending spacecraft into, into space? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me throw it out there. Does anyone have a, a thought on that? I, um, I, I, I had a part of answer because I already had many times this kind of question and it's a tricky one. So uh, once again, we, we cannot lie and say that it's a uh, no carbon uh, dioxide footprint to send something to space. Uh, on, on the um, transport part, uh, I think that there is lots of effort that are done by the manufacturer to do reuse, reusable, reusable things to reuse, <laughs> uh, to be reused. Uh, but it's maybe not enough. On the French Space Agency side, we have since uh, approximately two years, we need to uh, evaluate the carbon print of our system our payload and our satellite at each phase of the development. And it's not only about the hardware, but also um, people travel. For example, usually we have um, a satellite that are built at different locations in Europe. So we project manager need to do this exercise in order to try to limit um, the, the, the cost, the environmental cost of our activity. There is lots of sort of politics into debris management. But back to our activity, uh, I think what uh, I think it's, it's Matt or, or Natalie that uh, pointed this out. We need to be sure that the return of investment of our space um, makes sense. And this means, of course, look at the scientific part of the experiment, at the economic part, will that create a new market, will that uh, increase, for example, the efficiency of such a product, but environmental and societal impact, it's also part of this matrix analysis, can I say that? So uh, my, my answer to you, Lorraine, is if you need to do something in space, you should need of all the aspects of uh, that are implied by your activity. And if for your particular company, the environmental impact um, is more important that your return of investment in terms of patent, in terms of somehow saving life or increasing your market, I, I think it's something completely valuable and it makes sense. So it, it's kind of a non-answer what I, I'm saying here, but it's a uh, basically my point of view on this yeah. question. I would be very happy to hear uh, other point of view on that. It, it's a complex question. I can add to it a little bit. Um, you know, if you're flying a solid rocket motor, it depends on the rocket. If you're flying, flying a solid rocket motor, it has a large carbon footprint. If you're flying liquid hydrogen engines, um, you know, it's a water vapor is the output. So, you know, it really just depends on the type of rocket and type of, uh, you know, but, but the creation of liquid hydrogen perhaps has a, has a larger carbon footprint. So, you know, it's a trade-off. You've just got to make those decisions as you try to decide, you know, advancing yourself versus, uh, um, and, and always, you know, I think that every country is working towards different types of engines and different types of um, um, capabilities that are going to reduce that carbon footprint as they move forward. So. Uh, you know, again, I think it's just dependent on on what you fly on, and and uh, and really, I think it's going to only get better as the years progress. Yeah, I I think that's right, and you know, we have lots of examples of types of projects that are looking at using space to deal with climate change or sustainability um, or plastics in the ocean or ocean health. So I think you can also look at it from the perspective of, you know, space. Many times astronauts say you need to go off the planet to save the planet. And there are many things that you can do from a microgravity or a remote sensing standpoint to be looking at these types of, you know, sustainability solutions. And so one thing that I think came up quite a bit as we were all collaboration, partnerships, coming together in sort of the space expert with the cosmetics expert. Um, I want to bring up one story that I think will maybe spur some more questions, which is um, we were working with Eli Lilly, which is a, a pharmaceutical company based in uh, Indianapolis in the U.S. 
and they drove uh, over to Cleveland, Ohio, to Glenn Research Center, where Mike Johansson and um, the Zen folks are based right outside of the Glenn Research Facility. And they walked in and they were talking about um, four different types of experiments related to developing and delivering their, their drugs, their, you know, their therapeutic drugs. And when they walked by a conference room, they happened to look in and see Matt Lynch, who was um, looking at one of his experiments using this facility called BCAT. And Eli Lilly was having a really big problem understanding how they could actually lyophilize or freeze dry a drug. And in just brainstorming with Matt Lynch, they ended up coming up with a solution working with Zen Technology on bringing this together. And I just think it's a great example of how people from different industries or different skill sets, space and non-space, really do work together when you're talking about these space-based experiments in a very unique way. And out of this comes really true innovation. And I don't, I, and I just want to sort of throw that out to Matt and Mike. Um, you know, what were your impressions of that? And wh what is your impression of all of these partnerships? And you probably have other examples of these non-traditional partnerships that you've made in this type of, of research. You wanna, you wanna, Mike? Well, I can start and say that I've always said, you're only as good as the people you surround yourself with. Um, you know, and, and, and it's a small community and, and you get to know people and, uh, you know, I think that working together, you always come up with something better than trying to figure it out for yourself. Um, you know, lifelization kind of goes to what Natalie was um, talking about earlier uh, about less water. You know, freeze drying works very differently. The phenomena of freeze drying was very different to how we do it in the ground and what we found in space. Um, so that's a very good example of something you can learn from microgravity is how we can do things differently. But the partnership part of this is key. I think, you know, Finding the right partners that can help you along this process, you know, be it the person that helps you through the paperwork, um, builds the hardware and operates it, or comes up with a great idea, you have to have it all. And, uh, you know, you need that group around you that can make it successful. And I would just say, Cindy, um, one of the, uh, it's, it's a little bit of euphoria when you, when you go up to Glenn and you work up there because it's, it's just a unique place. Uh, and, Vanana Kennedy as well and Johnson, but you know, all these are unique places that do fantastic and fabulous sort of things. And uh, for those of us in the consumer product business and cosmetic business, sometimes with science and discussion, peers can be a bit of a challenge, right? There's, there's, a, there's, a, commercial, um, there's a commercial competitiveness against these groups and, and, and trying to share and, and, uh, and, and uh, open up on those ideas can sometimes be a little bit difficult, but you throw people into those environments um, and it becomes so overstimulating that you're like, oh, this is great. And, and it makes all the different ideas flow very well and very easily. Um, with the case of Lily, it's, it's that much easier. We, you know, we don't do pharma. Lily doesn't do consumer products, uh, to at least to my knowledge. So, so that, that's, that's just an easy sort of thing. I will also say that um, a lot of our original work got started with a soft matter research uh, consortium through a number of universities and professors as well. So through Penn, uh, Harvard, and through NYU, for example. And I, I still regularly talk with these people as well. And uh, in addition to people that fly, you get the sciencey piece from that. So it is a, it is an element of connectivity that uh, that, that you bring. It comes to forefront to the research, but I would also say the research grows these other opportunities that over the years that you can nurture and, and it's going to be helpful for you. In addition, it's kind of an ancillary benefit to doing this kind of thing as well. Yeah, yeah. And Hilda, I know you've had lots of interesting partnerships um, and. There's something about to, uh, crystallization incubator about to go up in August, which is the result of one of these partnerships. Yes, so we, we have this partnership with this Japanese company um, flying their crystallization incubator and we take on different companies or research institutes. And for example, in December, we had um, a Hungarian group um, combining uh, two companies, one pharmaceutical that did, for example, COVID-19 related research, first uh, ever to our knowledge in, in space. 
So I, I think it's really what we what we touched on before. I mean, that's what creativity and what innovation is about, is you put people from very different angles uh, and you shake them together and out comes something that none of these people, um, I mean, could have done on their own. And I think that's really um, also from, from the space angle. I mean, we talk about new space, new uh, market. That's for me what is most new is that we can build these new collaboration models, new, I mean, not only models, but new collaborations, new topics, new um, business models as well. And I think that's exactly what we need to discuss from these different angles and, and to put these heads together uh, and, and to make up these super interesting projects, uh, taking advantage of the different um, expertise. Great. Thanks, Hilda. Um, so over to Lucy, I think we have two minutes left. I don't know if um, there's a, a wrap up you want to provide and or, um, you know, any uh, last comments uh, before we end this session. Yeah, first of all, I would like to thank all our speakers. Thank you very much for sharing your expertise here with our audience. I would like to share Natalie uh, for co-organizing uh, this uh, webinar. And I really hope that this is only the first part of uh, our work together. Uh, my message is always the same, is that we had um, a great opportunity to hear about our US colleague, how it works in the US. And I think it's time for us to basically do the same <laughs> or to even to do it together at one point. I think it could be quite interesting. So my message to you is that um, if you're interested by this topic, even if you're not super sure that you want to do something in space because it look a little bit crazy right now, do not hesitate. We are here for you, uh, either to reach Natalie or myself. And so uh, we will be very happy to uh, discuss with you to maybe ask our expert again some very precise question if we don't have the answer. And um, yeah, I hope it was interesting. And thank you very much for Space Commerce Matter for the organization and Connect by Kness for the support. Thank, thank you, everyone. You. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. See, See you on. Good day. Good day. Good day. Thanks, everyone.